where does your bravery come from? Because you've been making these choices that are yeah. <laughs> brave that a lot of people would shy away from. Um, that's a really good question. I don't know the answer other than I'm an only child and my parents divorced. They were both lawyers and I was like drawn to do this and drawn to move to LA and they had like absolutely no interest or knowledge or understanding or even care really. They were into the arts, but like opera. Yeah, right. <laughs> so they were extremely encouraging, but I don't know. Sometimes I wonder that myself and I've tried and failed. It's not like it's all been like, oh, I'm going to be brave and it's going to go great. There's yeah. been plenty of things that I've been like, oh, okay, let's <laughs> not do that again. <laughs> Editors and creatives have never had this much power and tools at their disposal. Were you involved in the edit? How do you eat? Writing for me also is therapy. On today's episode, we have Marisa Coughlin, writer and actor of screens both big and small. I'm your host, Matt Alshurin, filmmaker and entrepreneur. Before we start today's episode, please don't forget to like, subscribe, and comment. Adobe released a tool last year, and I have a love-hate with the whole AI conversation. Yeah, I know. But they have an AI audio tool where you plug in your audio and... It cleans it up? Yeah. It's like... Oh, man. It's pretty ridiculous. Really? I don't know... I don't want to like it either, but oh, there's so many things you're like, really? No, I will refuse to use it for wholly creative purposes. Yeah. Like, to, to write a script, like, never, not once, I will quit before yeah. I do that. Yeah. But as a tool to clean up audio, Yeah. is that wrong? I don't think it's wrong, no. But, I mean, it is, it is a blurry line. I know. you just, like... I don't think they can take over for us because we are ultimately drawing upon a human experience that's relatable to other human beings. And I just don't think as smart as they are, they could ever pull on the nuances of that. But still, it's kind of scary. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, you tend to think like, okay, humans make mistakes and that the sloppiness is what makes us human. Yeah. And the robots are going to be too clean. But eventually, yeah. they're going to learn to also be sloppy and mimic our mistakes. Oh, that's scary because yeah. you do want to believe that they can't muster like like I said, those nuances, but it seems like they're smart enough to do that too. <laughs> and, it's, and it's early. It's yeah. It's really early. Yeah. Just give it five yeah. years I know. Or less. And I liked that movie, Her, mm -hmm. but now it feels like, oh, that feels uncomfortably close to yeah. Yeah. reality. I, yeah. It's going to be interesting. That much we can yeah. guarantee. <laughs> yeah. As long as Is we can it... still make a little tiny bit of money somehow if they don't just take away all of our jobs. Well, they're saying that they're going to have to start paying like people to sit around because the robots are going to be so efficient. That how do you make a functioning economy if everything's automated? That's bananas. I know. And like the the actor thing, you know, that they can just take your entire likeness and just your voice and replicate all of it and people won't even know the difference. That's so scary to me. It's yeah, kinda of fucked up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I don't <laughs> yeah, I don't I don't know if I wanna be involved in the field if we're just solely creating things no digitally. it's gonna be a couple of years where you're gonna be able to say okay i want you to create a action adventure in yeah. this using shakespeare's voice and i want you to um i want the leads to be uh marisa and brad pitt yeah and it will that be sounds able to, good it'll, yeah, right? <laughs> as long as you get the residuals <laughs> yeah. from that right? uh, yeah and it'll be able to do it which yeah. is like Especially for those like really formulaic movies that are just like you, you as a viewer, you're like, I know where this is going. Yeah. I know the beginning, the middle and the end. And that's kind of like the bread and butter of some mm -hmm. of those streamers or whatever. It's like they'll be very, it'll be yeah. pretty easy to replicate that. Yeah. I kind of view it, as, view it as a challenge. I think it's incumbent upon us filmmakers to figure out what's next. Yeah. yeah you know, that's a good way of looking I mean, at it. Defined by that, you know, 16 yeah. by nine frame for a hundred years yeah. or so. How can yeah. we start breaking out of that a little yeah. bit and telling new and different stories? Yeah. Um, I think we're going to have to. It will not be long before this, I could be in LA right yeah. now and you could be here and it feels like I'm, I'm starting together. to experiment with some of that stuff yeah. now. I, yeah. I don't like the headset. I, I don't feel either. like it's a prophylactic and like not communal. Yeah. But they might figure that part out too. But Andy Hunt told me that when he was shooting, it was during COVID and they were scouting Puerto Rico mm -hmm. to be, no, no, it was like Portugal or something to be, um, California or Mexico, that border. And he, they could just do all the entire scout through Oculus yeah. and just stand there and look around and be like, that would be good. And this does look a lot like whatever. And they would take, she'd, he'd pass it to his partner who would look. And I'm like, That's so well, they, they crazy. Had, they did pickup shoots here months after they shot in Portugal and his DP just remoted in and was on a screen the whole time looking and they could look at, she could look at shots from the camera. I think she's in UK or something. Yeah. 
um, and then just was on FaceTime the whole time and was able to... And we edited the whole movie virtually. Our editor was in LA. I mean, and it really didn't feel like it would be any different if I'd been there. I mean, maybe like you said, like we talked about earlier, like the chemistry of a room and like, okay, like this feels better to us because we're sort of collaborative a bit more. But I mean, for the most part, it was... Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, So you're born and raised in Minnesota. Yes. And then you went to USC. Went to USC. Did Mm -hmm. you go there for acting at that point? I did. I went to the BFA program there. Um, And, you know, it was an interesting choice in Uh retrospect. uh I had a great time and my best friends I met there, so I can't. And and I, I went, I got into Northwestern's theater department and I sort of have a little bit of like, oh, I feel like that just would have been the most like ideal, wonderful college experience, that little town and the Mm -hmm. whole vibe of it. And a lot Mm -hmm. of the people I know who came out of Northwestern, I just love so much. And, you know, Greg Berlanti I've worked with and he came out, Julie Pleck came out of there. There are people that I've worked with over the years that I'm like, whatever. I feel like it would have been a great experience, but I always felt like, I don't know if I'm ever going to have the nerve to move to LA if I don't just go now and like kind of have the infrastructure of college to kind of get me through the beginning. And I think it's probably true that I, think I don't think if I if I did go to Northwestern and I was in Chicago and embedded in this group of friends, would I have really had the nerve to just pick up and like go to LA on my own? I don't know. So yeah, I moved to LA, went to, I lived in the dorms, you know, borrowed my friend's cars to go on auditions, like missed a lot of classes. Oh, so you, you are like getting into it right, right, right away. away. Like, I was there probably, I was very determined. I was there probably a week and I, my dad wrote my cover letter mm-hmm. and I sent it to agents, mm-hmm. you know, it was, we're, I'm not, I'm not 30. So it was like, we didn't even have email. So we, I, my dad was a lawyer and he wrote this letter to whom it may concern. I have long been aware of your expertise in matters of professional interest to me. And that was the, the, the lead line. I'm like, and then my headshot where I'm like, <laughs> it probably didn't seem like I wrote that letter, but uh, it didn't have chat GPT back then. They, so exactly. They, didn't do that. Yeah. they had dad GPT. Um, so I sent out a bunch of headshots and I got a, I had two old ladies who were my agents who would call and just argue or leave messages and argue and whatever. It was pretty funny. It was class. I had a beeper, you know, were you were you booking any jobs then while you're in school? So I got a commercial was the first thing I booked, you know, a raisin brand commercial. And mm-hmm. back in the day, I think I made twenty thousand dollars for showing up and t- taking one photo that was in the background of the actor talking. And I was there for forty five minutes. I left, and I was like, "This is the best industry in the world." Holy and like, cow. never again did anything like that. Was yeah. it was you know obviously those commercial days are long gone. Yeah. But I just remember getting check. I was like, what? What kind of gravy train did I just, you know, but if you add up the auditioning hours I did for all the other commercials, I probably made like one cent an hour. That's the people don't talk. That's what people don't talk about. 100%. Yeah. I drove around and it was, you know, you'd have to go pick up scripts and pick up sides and go, I mean, the hours I spent in traffic and Mm -hmm. whatever, but it was a great time. It was a great time to be doing all that. It was super fun and I loved USC and loved my friends and then stayed there for a long time. I mean, I I was out there most of my career and then just moved back here when we had we were three kids deep, but I was like, I feel like maybe Minnesota. It would be nice to my husband's from here as well, from mm-hmm. Minnesota as well, and we just kind of both agreed for various reasons it was time. Yeah, tell me about that transition a little bit. I mean, you were from here, so you knew what you're coming into. Yeah, for the but most it was part. pretty foreign to me when mm-hmm. the time we moved back I'd been back for help but my parents I'm an only child had both moved to LA oh, and then funny. my dad passed away so it's just my mom there and so I wasn't back here that frequently and you know I'd super I was super fond of being here when I did come but it, mm-hmm. it, it had been a long time it did not feel like home at all when I we moved back and mm-hmm. we kind of came because my husband's dad was was ill and for various reasons so I wasn't like hundred percent on board with it but for a long time we sort of had a foot here and a foot there yeah. we were going back and forth but I had a newborn and I was like not really sure how functional this is I had my kids enrolled in preschool here and preschool there I mean I had wow. two houses we were renting one here and owned that one it was just not functional yeah. with three kids yeah so we ultimately and then I started to like get into the groove here and I really loved it and and, you know, missed it there. But a, a lot of my friends started to sort of start their families and leave L.A. too. And so, but I miss it. I mean, there's still 
humongous aspects to it that I miss. Yeah. I'm grateful now that I feel much more embedded in the creative community here. But for probably five years, I didn't really know anyone here mm-hmm. in that in this community. And I felt super isolated. I would just meet moms who were lovely, but I didn't have that much in common with them because I was like, I felt like a sort of a creative offbeat. I would make yeah. inappropriate jokes and they like totally wouldn't get them or, uh-huh. They, uh-huh. or they would get them and not think it was funny and think that I was inappropriate, which is fair. But I finally found, you know, yeah. my way into this crowd, which do you, helped. Do you think finding your way into the crowd, do you think there was some resistance either from the crowd or from yourself being that you had success elsewhere? Um, or is it just a, you didn't find a your lot way? of it was just logistically I was out in the south out, out in Wayzata uh-huh. you know I'm very busy with my kids I was selling shows in LA and then busy anytime my kids weren't with me I was busy writing yeah so I just wasn't networking I just wasn't in those circles yeah. I just didn't well, I didn't even know how kids, to find them so <laughs> yeah, like how exactly. do you juggle then I had another that? baby exactly so then. Yeah. I was keeping the relationships alive in LA and that was so much work to just be selling shows and writing them and trying to maintain you guys I'm still a part of this like you know to not feel like they sort of just move on from you and then I just didn't have the bandwidth and then I started to slowly incrementally meet more people here and you know I shot a couple things here and then more recently shot a, a bigger thing here and I met Jaden was helpful. He really is great about connecting dots. Twin Cities Film Twin Fest. Cities Film Fest. Yep. He was really wonderful. And then I met Brittany Benjamin and she was really wonderful. And it slowly it happened. But yeah, yeah I mean, there might have been like some uh, resistance that, you know, whatever. But hopefully we've, we're through that. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. Well, I mean, we, you know, there's the Minnesota nice thing here. Yeah. And then, you know, LA is a lot of like transactional based relationships too, yes. which can be its own. Yes. Set of challenges. So yes. navigating both of those simultaneously yeah. can be quite the experience. Yes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it gets to be like, oh, I just feel like one of eight million yeah. writers, actors. On the other hand, you come here and I'm like, oh, I, where are my people? Like, right. I don't, I, I don't, I don't maybe want to be one yeah. of three million, but I want to be like, have my creative brethren who are tortured and thinking about things and yeah, is this funny throw, or not funny and you know <laughs> you can throw a rock out there and hit somebody that knows a lot about movies and filmmaking yeah. and you can yes. have those conversations yes. here you have to find and you really have people. to find them and just to have people to sit and have a drink with and be like oh, this is what I'm thinking about what are you thinking about and mm-hmm. you know now I have a couple p- go to people here that I can go for a walk and be like okay this is the thing I need a couple of, bounce this off you and is this like does this even track and yep, yep. without that you feel very isolated totally. well there's more people moving back as yeah. of late too so yes. I think it's going to get easier to have some of those yeah, conversations I think so I think so mm-hmm. and it's like we said before, like the fa- the actual FaceTime factor is is, mm-hmm. is is makes it better. Like I do have creative friends in LA, but it's just not the same. It's yeah. just sitting down together and breaking bread and kind of talking about whatever mm-hmm. kind of comes up organically as opposed to like, can we have a designated Zoom phone call to talk about ideas? <laughs> right, <laughs> you know? right. So you just go back and forth a lot. You never lived there, but you would just go out and do meetings and come Yeah, back. I mean, I lived there. I made a movie there, so I was there probably. Okay six months total yeah. one year yeah um so lived right in the valley um but yeah i was there five times a year yeah probably yeah I just haven't in the last handful of years i know since covid actually there's been no need i mean i feel like i i'm overdue for going back mm-hmm. simply for just like hey let's get a drink with a few yeah. people that i you know yeah like to see and like i said before it's like i without the occasion we just kind of drift and then i'd yeah. But, and I mean, so many of my best friends are still there. So yeah. I do for that reason. But yeah, you're right. There's not. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I you know, I made that last movie in 2019 and then COVID happened. And um, but that's the one you shot there? No. That you one. You shot that here. That one we shot 2015, I think. Okay. Um, okay. The one in 2019 we shot here. Okay. And then COVID happened. And I'm like, you know what? I'm going to take an intentional break from writing and developing and doing yeah. any actual movie stuff. Um, so there's been no need to go out there other than I miss some of my friends. So you're still taking that break? I'm no? I'm getting closer. Oh. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> we started this thing. Yeah. Right? Which is yeah. like kind of scratching that itch. Yeah. And I'm helping other people on stuff. Yep. Um, so you don't like write during the interim? It... This is the first time in 20 years where I'm not actively writing something. Huh. Feels, How does it feel? It feels kind of good. I tried to describe to someone recently. I was like, I saw it written somewhere. Some Some Instagram account I probably follow about writers. It's like... Being a writer is like feeling you like you have homework that's late every single minute of your life. Yep. <laughs> like, yep. oh my God, it's so true. No, it, it, it is exactly true. 
It's so frustrating, isn't it? I mean, the only good thing about it is that like part of the job is to just ruminate. I mean, half the best ideas I've come up with, I feel like it's like I'll sit up in the middle of the night and be like, oh my God. Okay, I got to text myself this idea before I forget, you know, but mm-hmm. but it's the best and the worst part of it is that. Yeah, well, writing for me also is therapy in a lot of ways because you work a lot of stuff out mm-hmm. or you live vicariously through your character yes. so you're feeling these things. You escape, yeah, yeah, totally. So I haven't been to therapy in yeah. a while yeah. <laughs> in that regard. I'm doing okay because yeah. I'm, I'm busy doing a lot of other things. Yeah. Um, and I used to, you know, I'm kind of a night owl, so I do my writing at yeah. night. Yeah, Now with kids, like by 9 o'clock, I'm like... I know. Kind of tapped out. I know. Getting to that age. This morning yeah. I was up at 5 a.m. Like, okay, i got to turn this thing in. I'm just going to like crank this out in yeah. the wee hours before. Because you're right. I'm the same. I'm like at night. I'm like done. Yeah. I don't. Totally. The creative juices are not flowing. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. <laughs> All right. Let's go back a little bit. Okay. Um, the inter- internet says teaching Mrs. Tingle was your kind of breakthrough role. Yeah. Is that true? And you worked with some bigger names on that. Was yes. That, what was that experience like? Uh You know, it's kind of the cliche, like I was, what was I, 24, I was living in like a guest house in Malibu randomly, which was amazing because the guy had, my my best friends decided to move to New York, my roommates, and I was like, okay guys, but um, what am I supposed to do? So I was just putting feelers out to like anyone that had like a place to rent and someone knew someone who knew this guy whose dad was in jail (laughs) for like doing some white collar crime. So the assets were frozen and the son was just living in this unbelievable mansion on the bluffs of Malibu over like with one of those infinity pools that goes off the edge into the ocean and the guest house was available. So I was like, okay, I guess I'll, so I moved out there and I just would, it was that El Nino year. And so you couldn't even really come and go and randomly. And I wasn't auditioning much. And I was just like, this is just dumb. What am I, I'm living this great life out here, but I'm not working. I'm not anything. And it's outside of LA a little bit. It was, it was a little bit isolated, but it was a good kind of isolated. And then my dad was like, let's just, maybe you should just call it. He was very supportive, but he's like, you could go to business school outside of Paris. And I was, I think I'd even maybe started applying to this business school outside of Paris. And cliche thing. But then I got this audition to go do this, uh, um, to Kevin Williamson movie and part of the audition was to do the this exorcist scene and I think I just got lucky that like it didn't even <laughs> it didn't even occur to my brain that there was like a a cool version of doing it it just only occurred to me to go like balls to the wall bananas actually like replicate exactly what the scene was Mm -hmm. and I have a feeling all these like super cute LA girls went in they were like what a lovely time for an exorcism I don't know what they did (laughs) but I was just like (laughs) completely eyes rolling back in my head crazy voices spasming I mean when I finished I looked at them and I was like oh okay no one else made this choice this is apparent by your reactions so I left but I didn't hear anything so I was like whatever and then I got a call saying you know you have a call back and I went and did it again and I had a feather boa and all sorts of whatever I just really went for it mm-hmm. and then I didn't hear anything again and then I got a call that I got this job and then I absolutely panicked I was just like I can't I'm like I am doing like shitty guest spots on super bad shows really like diagnosis mm-hmm. murder where mm-hmm. you know I was the victim and I was dead after three lines and and then I got this thing where I'm sparring with Helen Mirren for two hours. And I was just like, I, you know, was like full imposter syndrome. Like they are going to figure me out day one and I'm going to be fired. And we had to do a table read, which did you, did you act too? No. Okay. Thank God. So there's like nothing worse than a table read for me because you never know if people are going to come in and be like level 10, level one. You just don't like, and nobody else knows what everyone else is going to do. And, and every half the room is just there as an audience and you're performing, but not, it's just like, I hate it. I've had to do them, but never, my career was never on the line. Right. 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 And I've been a part of many table reads where someone gets fired immediately thereafter. So like, I just wanted, I'll never forget the sinking feeling. I was in the Sony lot and I was like, this is it. I'm going to get fired. They're going to be, you know, and anyway, it went really well. And Helen Mirren was amazing. And honestly, the whole experience was probably one of the best of my life. It was just like magical, wonderful summer camp on the Sony lot. And Katie was wonderful. And Katie Holmes, Katie Holmes. Yep. And, and uh, was Williamson like had Dawson's Creek already been a thing at that point? Yes, they were. Oh, so they were tippy top of the culture. Level 10 famous. Yeah. Everywhere you looked was a billboard of Katie Holmes. And Barry Watson was our other, you know, teen co-star. And he was very famous then. They flew us to the Bahamas. I was like 
completely unfamous. So they flew us to the Bahamas for some, what's that Bahamas big resort that's like... Sandals or something? No, it's not sandals, but it's whatever. It's just big Vegas-y style, huge Mm. whatever. They flew us there for some kind of publicity events, and I'll never forget because we would like stand still for like three minutes and we'd be under the radar. And then one person would notice that it was Katie Holmes and it was just like, like hundreds of people would swarm and then they'd move and they would just swarms would follow. I'm like, this is a weird life you guys Mm -hmm. are living, which, you know, Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, yeah, it was a pretty phenomenal experience. Yeah. You got to be, you got the VIP treatment just hanging out with those two. Yeah. Probably got a taste of. I did. It was kind of nice because I, I wasn't, famous so mm-hmm. I was just sort of like famous adjacent and I got to be like this is weird I don't think I'd actually want, want this life but it's kind of cool to just witness it you know yeah. in uh, from the inside but yeah. yeah it would be a stressful way to live I think yeah it kind of seems like the worst and kind of does ways. seem like the worst to I be know. honest yeah careful like, what you wish for the zoo animal I mean I know it's been discussed <laughs> but it felt it seemed like that with them mm-hmm. it fades out right like I'm sure now she's not mobbed like that but still it was um weird but yeah it was a phenomenal um Helen Mirren was like amazingly kind and respectful. And I mean, you Mm -hmm. know, I felt like such a, like this big, she'd just come off of that show in the UK. She was super famous at the time. And, you know, just as she is today. Helen Mirren at that point. Uh, Was she a Dane at that? I don't think she was yet. Or it could be wrong, but Mm -hmm. I don't think so. But, Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so I didn't quit, obviously. Yeah. (laughs) Didn't go to business school in Paris. (laughs) Thank God. Yeah. I don't know. You might be running uh, Microsoft by now. Right. (laughs) Exactly. But yeah. Was it? uh, Yeah. Life takes its its veers, and you don't know what's coming your way. But uh-huh. yeah, and then then what happened after that? Um, it, so happened right away, or did it take so, a little time to? Get well, into it? so that was like they were editing that, and it hadn't come out yet. And then Kevin was developing a series for ABC, and they offered me the lead in this show called Wasteland. And I, you know, again, I'd come out of like crappy guest star land to this movie Mm -hmm. i'm not gonna be like no thank you i don't want to be the lead in your show and kevin was like everything he touched turned to gold so i did that and that was did not turn to gold as Mm -hmm. you know because you've never heard of that show (laughs) (laughs) so we but we had a great experience we shot 12 episodes i think they aired one did they even air it i think they aired one and then they canceled it yeah and um but it was still a great experience. And yeah. then I did Freddy Got Fingered, uh-huh. which was an interesting experience. And the cult movie now. Yeah, it was just on that um, Criterion channel. Or oh, was it really? Yeah. 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 Which, I mean, that movie continues to astound me because it's so weird and out there on every conceivable level and like ends up in these like weirdly, like that when that New York Times film reviewer mm-hmm. retired. He wrote a whole thing about that movie. About that movie, I just it baffles me. But um, and then you know, I just it's it's a weird for everyone. I know yeah. it's like a weird it's a weird career. You get momentum, you lose mm-hmm. momentum. You get it back, you lose it again. I think you have to. When I was pregnant with my oldest, who just turned fifteen, I started writing. I I was on a show called um, Boston Legal. Yep. You, you might remember, but um, and that was like front row seat to the best writing ever yeah and front row seat to just how quickly he could metabolize the world who, who was events. that david kelly that's right yep like the and he was a big deal too biggest yeah and the show was a big deal and it was just sort of a small part and like i was supposed to be two episodes and it turned into like a whole season of being his assistant and then it went a couple more episodes the next season and it was such a phenomenal experience just because James Spader, like, weird dude, but holy smokes, is he phenomenal so to watch. Like, he would have a monologue that was two pages of just legalese, and he would do one take, and you're like, okay, let's, like, there's literally no reason to shoot that again. It was perfection. He would barely look at me in the eyes ever unless we had a scene, but he was just weird. But <laughs> it was so... Um, would the the floods happen in New Orleans yep. during while we were shooting an episode, and... A week later, there was an episode about it. I mean, literally, like four days later, I had a script that was an episode about it that I was in that I was like, I don't understand how you... <laughs> yeah. <What? laughs> um, well, he had so much power, he probably didn't need to ring it up the flagpole. He didn't pole. have to do anything. He had a writing staff, and I think they didn't write anything because mm-hmm. he would just... He's just brilliant, and he would just... And he's a lawyer, and he's just great at dialogue and funny characters, and he would just crank it out. And 
So I was on that show and I had a really great, funny character with great banter. And I was like, I knew I wanted to write. And so I just, as a challenge to myself, wrote an episode of it with my character having like a really funny, mm-hmm. <laughs> shamelessly of, of self-serving. Of course, why wouldn't you, right? And then I wrote it and I printed it up and I brought it to set and Julie Bowen was on that show. Yep. And she, I had become friendly with her and I'm like, so I wrote a script and, you know, for my character and whatever, and I'm going to give it to, you know, the producer. She was like, you're going to what? No, don't, don't do that. That is a very bad idea. (laughs) She was just like, (laughs) just like give it to some, give it to the hair and makeup department or something. Do not do that. But I did it. And then, um, yeah, that kind of like started the ball for me because the, the, it went to the the woman who ran the development and hired the writers and she called me and she's like, we're not going to make this. And this, this parts of the storyline are like insane. And we, even we couldn't do it, even right. though he has right. free range to do whatever he wants. But she's like, you should be doing this. And so I started writing. That's amazing. I mean, they could have not said anything, right? They could have. Yeah. She, to this day, she'll follow me. Like if mm. something happens and I sell something, she'll like text me and be like, I'm really, you know, she was incredibly encouraging and I don't think I would have probably pursued it. You know, had that one experience gone the other way, I would have been like, well, I tried. I'm not good at it. And instead, she was like, you, like, yeah. go do this. So. It's amazing how much that matters to have that one person, like, validate truly, you. Truly. You know. Because especially as an actress turned writer, maybe it's actor turned, maybe it's across the board, but I feel like maybe as a woman it's more so. I'm sure. I just felt like kind of... Not to throw Julie under the bus, but like I just feel like generally there's a like, oh, that's so cute that you're gonna try to write. Mm-hmm. Like, good luck with that, mm-hmm. honey. Pat you on then, the head. Yeah, yeah. and yeah. like, um, just a general underestimation thing happening, and so I felt empowered by her being like, I read a lot of people who want to write for him, and yeah. like you capture their voices in a way that yeah. they don't, and you should do this. And yeah. So, yeah. Where, where does your bravery come from because you've been making these choices that are yeah. <laughs> brave that a lot of people would shy away from um, that's a really good question mm-hmm. I don't know the answer other than I'm an only child and my parents divorced and they were both extremely encouraging of me pursuing the things that mm-hmm. I, I felt drawn to they were both lawyers and I was like mm-hmm. drawn to do this and drawn to move to LA and they had like Mm -hmm. absolutely no interest or knowledge or understanding or even care really my Mm -hmm. mom's into the they were into the arts but like opera yeah right (laughs) they weren't into like the way I was so they were extremely encouraging but I don't know sometimes I wonder that myself because I've and I've tried and failed it's not like it's all been like oh I'm gonna be brave and it's gonna go great there's been plenty of things that I've been like oh okay (laughs) let's not do that again (laughs) right but um I don't know yeah uh Super Troopers, Mm -hmm. was that as fun to work on as it looked, or was it, you know, making sausage? No, it was fun. I mean, those guys, uh, listen, we were, they're a few years, they're maybe five years older, and, um, but everybody was single and under 30, I guess, and I didn't know them at all, and they were a comedy troupe mm-hmm. they had seen actually the exorcist scene is why i got the job oh, because jay chandrasekhar was directing and he saw the movie and he's like well she can do that she can come play with us and be a cop or whatever so he offered it to me and I, you know when i felt like it i feel like throughout my career it's sometimes you get offers for little indies and they have no money and it's usually like maybe not the best script ever and mm-hmm. i was reading it just like laughing out loud the entire I mean it was very much on the page I sent it to one of my best friends who's a comedy writer who's like very similar sense of humor and he was like you have to do this movie and it was Mm -hmm. a million dollar movie they had I mean they didn't have hair and makeup trailers they didn't have they they had a hair and makeup trailer they didn't have wardrobe trailers they didn't have cast trailers for I mean we were like all sitting around in fields between you know Uh but um Brian Cox was like what the fuck am I doing pretty much yeah yeah. um but it was really really fun I mean I I had to find my way into their you know because they were they were a crew crew, and they were like a party crew too at that stage probably still but i mean so and i wasn't i actually you know i wasn't maybe as much as they were you know but it was it was a very fun experience and certainly like over time man what a fun thing to be a part of yeah i know stolhansky lived here for a while did you cross paths when you moved back at all like were you in town we went to the same high school oh you did so when we 
he was five years older, so mm-hmm. I just thought he was like this really hunky senior when I was in whatever, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. junior high. And uh, so when I did move back, he was living here. We did cross paths. We crossed, We hung out too in LA. We were friendly and had sure. the Minnesota connection and everything. And um, and then he's in the meantime moved to Florida, I think. But yeah. And I stayed, I was really good friends with Jay after we shot the movie. Kevin Heffernan, I directed something and he was in it. So I've stayed in touch Funny. with all of them. I was at some film event with Eric a few years back, and people would bring up maple syrup. Yeah, give him maple oh syrup, gosh, and he yeah. would he wouldn't drink it anymore. He yeah. like I'm sure he learned his lesson, but yeah. he'd be like, "Go ahead if you want." And yeah. these fans would just would ch- oh my god, that's so maple funny. syrup. I'm like, yeah, no, there's... Can we get an EMT in here because someone's gonna, about to go into a diabetic <laughs> coma. I think. There's like there's it's fun. It's like I said, it's like really. Um, I feel really lucky to be a part of something like that because yeah. it is not just a cult favorite but it's across so many generations yeah. like 20 year olds today uh-huh. you know 50 year olds today 30 40 i mean it's just like maintained kind of and it's going to be popular for another yeah. 20 30 yeah. 40 it's years funny. i mean I, I i truly feel very lucky to be a part of it yeah i haven't seen it in probably a decade so i don't remember but did you have scenes with brian cox at all not a lot of interaction, no. Yeah. No. Um, I mean, probably like cro- crossing, yeah. but not really. Yeah. No. I just love Succession um, so much. That yes, I know. Boy. I know. Um, no, it wasn't as much with him, but, you know, all of them, I was in a little a little touched with them, but I showed, showed it to my son a year or two ago, and I was like, okay, you, you're ready. <laughs> He's 15, so. Yeah, no, 15 is definitely yeah. the right demo. It's probably made for 15-year-olds. Pro- probably, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Funny. Yeah. So going back to your writing roots, you wrote a script for Days When the Rains Came. Yes. Right? Kind of, And it was a little autobiographical Yeah. Yeah. Well, okay. So, yes. My, my dad passed away when I was 29. And um, we moved back here as a family. And, well, I hadn't been here since high school, really. And so it was just triggering memories of my dad a lot because you know I this where I was raised and all the things I did with him all of a sudden like missing him felt much more acute and just nostalgia for those days in high school and all that and then we moved into the neighborhood where my like high school boyfriend went and so I just sort of wrote it as an exercise to be about go like all the things about what you thought your life was going to be versus what it is and you know ultimately it's it's about grief. It's about family. I mean, most of it is made up. Like, my relationship with my husband is not what it is in the movie. I had to put a, throw some extra a thorns. Hollywood it a little bit. Yeah, yeah I had to yeah. Hollywood that up a little bit. And and I invented sisters and all sorts of things. But um, the grief part of it is certainly very autobiographical. And the nostalgia for, like, kind of who you thought you were going to be versus who you are. And it's, it's certainly, um, you know, she's... The character is an actress who comes back to Minnesota. And my dad was like unbelievably proud of me no matter what I did. So, I mean, the crappiest guest star, he'd be like, you're made this, <laughs> you made it, you know? So it's, mm-hmm, she doesn't mm-hmm. feel like a success at all. Yeah. But her, like we were talking about when you were saying, you know, people are like, you've made four movies and, you know, you never really feel like, oh, yeah. I've, I've crushed it, you know? Right. So, but she's, a, the characters especially just sort of floundered and ended up doing um, like loop group kind of stuff. And yep. so I sort of say in the movie, she feels like dream adjacent. Like she's like staring at the people who are doing the job that she wants to be doing. And so it's just about midlife and mm-hmm, mm-hmm. all the things. And then you decided to make it. Yeah. Right? That was a, yeah. yeah. So tell, tell us about that process. So I wrote it just mostly as a cathartic exercise and I'd never written a full feature. I've, I've written like, I don't know. I don't honestly probably like 20 TV pilots and then some for fun, some because I sold the idea, whatever. But I've written a lot of TV. I'd never written a feature, and it seemed kind of daunting. The begin, it's a lot longer, and just the structure of it, or whatever. But I like freeform. Just I didn't outline. I didn't. I didn't note card. I just puked it out, and then I just left it there. I didn't show it to anybody. I just left it there. And then I was working with another writer, and he was like, "Have you ever written a feature?" I said, "I've written one, but I don't. Even, I have no idea if it's any good or whatever." I sent it to him, and. I don't know, for whatever reason, he read it and called me. He's like, this is really good. Like, why don't you do this? And I think it resonated for him. I mean, I think it's particularly for people who are in that phase of life. With and the it. kind of movie they don't make much of anymore. They don't make them much anymore. And it's not, you know, it is about going home, which sounds like it would be a Hallmark movie, but it's it's about, it's not. It's about 
marriage. It's about kids. It's about grief. It's kind of like, but you're right. They don't make that many movies like that anymore. And it, it resonated enough with him that he was like, a week later, he called me. He's like, I think we should make your movie. I'm like, what? And then he just kind of, to his credit, he said, October 10th, start date. We're going to make your movie. And it just became this sort of like juggernaut of energy towards the start date. And as I said the other day in this to you, I think you're in the panel. It was like we were building the plane as it was flying yep. because it was we didn't even have a producer. We just really we were raising money up until the day. You know, it was insanity in retrospect. I think I lost like 20 pounds just like <laughs> stressing out of not eating mm -hmm. and just like I was a basket case casting and I was played the lead. I mean, it was a it was a. It was a big swing. Yeah. Start dates are the secret sauce to getting I, stuff made. So we st October 11th was our start date. We that's, were off by amazing. one day. And mm -hmm. I, I, I did learn a lot from that. That like, same with I just forced myself to write a pilot by my birthday, which is March 17th. And I, I mean, the day I finished it March 16th because I just was like, you have to do this. You have to. And it was like, having a deadline really changes things, especially yeah. for writers, because I can just come up with any reason. Yeah. And I found two, uh, two of my movies were done independently. And even when you're in the financing or raising money round, yeah. when you say, hey, yeah, we're shooting a movie, yeah. you know, yeah. this fall, are you on yeah. the train or are you off? Totally. And then people are like, oh, shit. It's the, kinda... if you build it, they will come. Mm -hmm. Like, And then once you start hiring people, <laughs> you're like, we can't turn back. Because I would, I, you know, like all of us, I think, I'm somewhere in between like incredibly brave and incredibly terrified. Yeah. So like, you're like, let's do it. And like, never mind, let's yeah. not, like abort, let's go home. You know, uh -huh. you just don't want to do it. And what if we can And what if, what if, what if, what if it's enough reason to just go home and, you know, <laughs> put your pajamas on and quit all the time, right? Yeah. So because we had a start date and we started hiring people and we'd invested, I mean, we just couldn't turn so back. One foot so. in front of the other. Yeah, yeah it's really, hard. Truly, truly. Did you ever read that book, Bird by Bird? Bird by Bird, no. <clears throat> Annie Lamott. Oh, I, yeah, I know, yeah. She has this great line in the book that she's like, she did a, she was, when she was a kid, she was overwhelmed by a science project and it was like about birds <laughs> And her dad, that's the name of the title, is Bird by Bird. Like, you don't need to know all the things about all the birds. Let's just go through Bird by Bird. So that's the name of the title, but kind of the theme of the whole book is that. And she said she compared it to kind of when you're driving your car and your headlights are on and you can only see like the eight feet in front of your headlights. But like all you need to see right that minute is what's those eight yep. feet. And then you get the next eight and then you need the next. And that's kind of how I just did it. I was like, okay, we we're, I, I don't need to know. In a month, what's gonna? We just need to get to the next right thing. <laughs> yeah, the the metaphor I use all the time is I don't know if it's African or Indian proverb, but how do you eat an elephant? It's one bite at a time. Yeah, that's great. Because if you yeah. look at the elephant, you're like, yeah. I, it's impossible to so, it's so do that. And even right now, like I sold a show to ABC, and it's so. If I think about the all the whole thing, it's overwhelming. But I'm like, I just have to get through the story document, and I mm -hmm. it felt at the beginning like, how are all these pieces going to come together? And then I just just it's only as hard as you make it. Yep. Just calmly sit down yep. and let it just be what it's going to be. And yep. now it's pretty much done and I've turned it in and I'm like, okay, yep. we're through that part. Now on to the next. Totally. You know? But if yeah. you over, it's easy to overwhelm yourself. Yeah. I want to come back to the ABC thing, but um, what was the most challenging thing that you came across when filming? Oh man. That's a really good I mean, there's question. probably, there's a lot of them. There's so many things. Anything that was like surprising to you maybe. We shot it over COVID. Which was so, its like, own Freddie level. Freddie Rodriguez of... got COVID and had to be in a hotel and we had to cancel a bunch of his scenes and he had to basically go home. And yeah. We had to rewrite some of the stuff because of that. I would do it so differently next time and we didn't, we didn't really have prep. We didn't really plan it that well. So it was just, and I felt personally like he was directing it, but we were very collaborative because I'd written it and I was in every scene and so we were together and... There was so many aspects to worry about. And then I was acting in every scene. Mm -hmm. And then it was personal to me. Right. And then we shot it in my house. And my kids played my kids. I mean, it was just like, it was just so much. Yeah. <laughs> Which is both good and bad. Yeah. Um, was and, it was it challenging on set when, like, you know, crew members, obviously there's a hierarchy that's in place. It's yeah. well established. Yeah. But it's your movie. Yeah. Was there a weird dynamicism issue? It was hard. I mean, Mills was, um, Mills was. The director. Yeah. Mills, the director was, he really was, he would call me aside and be like, but it, it was hard because I have a strong personality 
And I, there were moments that I would be like, we should just do it like this, but I, I would be undermining to him. Yep. And so we'd have to go have like private yeah. meetings and you can't do that all the time when you're under the gun and whatever. And there were some things that both of us, I think felt like when we watched, we went into, into editing, we're like, what? How did we not catch that? But it's because I think I felt like I couldn't say it. And he felt like, you know, it's just, you learn as you go. And there were, and he was very respectful and, and inclusive of me. It wasn't like, I'm the director, leave me alone. He'd always be like, what do you think about this? But also you're under the time pressures of a budget like that. And um, I think I would say, as I mentioned before, I would, I would definitely leave a lot of money for post. I learned that the hard way because you just, as a newbie, producer really I just underestimated how much you need to how much it matters and how much is no matter what you shoot if you don't do post right it doesn't even matter like if and and even if you shoot and what you shoot is a five you can make it an eight but if you don't have the money for post and if you don't have the art artistry and the music and editor if you shoot a 10 it doesn't matter it will be like a three it's like it's garbage because and I didn't understand that and now I have like a much more, a much stronger understanding of all the pieces and, uh-huh. and where I would spend the money and where I wouldn't. And unfortunately, I didn't, we didn't really have a producer on board who could sort of do that from the outset. Right. It was just kind of like we were just figuring it out, recovering from mistakes yep. as we went. And uh-huh. so I would really do it differently next time. How did it inform your work as an actor being on that side? I mean, I was really daunted by doing the movie. I mean, A, I'd been here writing and like, you're like, can I, am I even going to be good? Like, can I even act anymore? Like, I don't know. (laughs) I'm like writing and I, I, I have done some stuff and flown off to do like little things, but not every single scene in a feature film. That's a big swing. Carrying it. Yeah. And, and I'm used to being honestly like the character role. I mean, I'm used to coming in and being the, the funny, weird one and not necessarily like the, uh, uh, you know, Katie Holmes was sort of the mainstay in teaching Mrs. Tingle and she's yeah. kind of the rock and you see it all through her perspective. And I'm used to in the movie, Eliza Coop, who's a genius. And I was so lucky to get her to be in this movie. It's, I can't even tell you, but she plays the role that I normally play, which is like the quippy mm-hmm. sister who comes in and says something and gets out. And I wasn't used to being the the sort of heart and soul of it. That And I was worried. Like, am I going to, if I don't make, if I make big choices like I'm used to making, that's going to wear, that's going to get old fast. Uh-huh. And if uh-huh. I, but if I'm too subtle, is it going to be boring? Like I watched that movie, um, This Is Where I Leave You, Jason Bateman. Oh, I haven't seen that. Oh God, is it's it, a is really good? good movie. Okay. I really like it. Um, I like, I mean, it's crazy, but I really like it. And he's sort of the mainstay, but he's more used to being that guy. Like yeah. he's always that guy, but I would watch movies like that and be like, okay. So I was nervous about that. I was nervous about carrying a movie in a role, in a role that was just grounded and more subtle and more bouncing off of everyone else's crazy than being the crazy one, mm-hmm. you know? Were you involved in the edit a lot or were you getting cuts and just giving feedback or how did that work? That's a good question too. Well, Mills and the, we had a um, director in LA, they went off and did a cut and I flew to LA to see the cut and I think she's used to like um, really big budget movies. So I feel like she was sort of getting us to the point at which you start fine tuning and we were thinking we're getting to the point where we're out of money and this is going to be a finished product. So I went out and saw that and was like, uh, what? <laughs> we're, we don't have like a lot of budget left for editing. And yet this feels it needs a significant amount of finessing. Yep. So then after that, I was on board. And after that, it was a function of kind of, uh, being kind of real, um, kind of speedy like just like okay we have a week to kind of get in there and fine tune and as you know that's a that's a tall order you know yeah it's um so I learned a lot I mean I a Uh lot it would be like and she's a great editor because she would she would she taught me things and it's like okay I we had to cut out this section of the scene and and I'm sitting down I, I needed to sit down and so she reversed a getting up moment so it looks like I'm sitting but yep. really it wasn't getting I mean yep. she would 
put words in my mouth by I mean it was, it's nuts what you can do. Yep. Um but in and it's an insanely creative job. I actually really loved it. I really it's, there's so much power in the so edit. Much power. I don't think people understand. You can just I mean there was one I don't want to there was one person who was tonally sometimes a little bit different. Like sometimes we're in a we're in a slapstick comedy and sometimes we're in a drama. Like I don't know. Yeah. So we it, it was amazing to me how we kind of like could edit that into like this fluid, beautiful performance that I learned a lot. And who knows who's made or you know either ruined my performance or made my performance well. I always in say editing room. I always say when an actor accepts an award for their performance, they should really be thanking the editor Honestly, too because you can so destroy you, you can just dist- crush someone. Yeah, anyone. Yeah. I mean, because everyone has bad takes. Everyone has weird, makes weird choices <laughs> yep. or looks terrible or, you know, I mean, you could just destroy people. Mm-hmm. Like I, doing it was really eye-opening. Yeah. And then coloring the movie was eye-opening. Sound design. I mean, I've just, I've, I've of course have been like a little bit a part of it, yep. but never like this. And it was amazing. I learned so much. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's in post, finishing post now. We're done. You're done. We're done. Yeah. Like, as of basically a week ago, we, we did the final things on the color. We, we, I'm really happy with the color. I mean, really, we're, we're like done. So now we're moving into um, finding a dance partner. Distribution and yes. And which is, as you know, just like a whole nother. I mean, it's like going to film school times a million, you know? Yep. But yep. Um, just the learning by doing, which is awesome. I don't, I probably learned them, but everyone probably learns the best For by sure. that. It's just a little bit scary when you have a lot mm-hmm. of money on the line. But <laughs> not a little bit scary, really scary. But uh, but it's great. You just have to find you're right, the right person to kind of have the vision and shepherd it and not expect to take like 90% of the <laughs> revenue. <laughs> yeah. That's all we ask. We could, we could do hours and hours on yeah. distributors yeah. i have a love hate you need yeah. them but yeah they're mm-hmm. yeah uh there's a handful of good ones out there yeah yeah for sure i'm gonna pick your brain on that later please <laughs> keeping it on the distributor studio side you, yeah. you just mentioned you sold something to abc can yeah. you can you say anything about that um yeah i mean i have a long-standing relationship with them they were uh, the two women that really run abc comedy were at warner brothers studios for a long time and I actually, in addition to the woman at, in development at um, David Kelly's company, there was a, a man who ran Warner Brothers Studios named Len Goldstein, who's a good friend of mine now, who also gave me, he basically gave me my first job as a writer. Mm. And he, I came in and pitched like 10 ideas and he just picked one and I wrote it. And it, what, it wasn't really that good, but then he gave me the chance to rewrite it. And then I got it made by ABC. So it was just like, I don't know how that happened, but it, it was a series of, fortuitous things and also he gave me the chance to redo it because yeah. the first time it w- wasn't good and then he let me just kind of have another crack at it with some anyway those women that worked with him now run ABC so I've had this great relationship for a long time I've sold a few different projects to them over the years and um we're f- friendly outside of work to some extent and they trust you they trust me yes mm-hmm. they know me personally and they trust me I think as a writer and we I'd actually pitched something else to them that they didn't buy. And um, we ended up having like a follow-up conversation about it. And they said, we really want to work with you. And we really feel like something you said at the end of the pitch resonated. And what I said to them was, I had been um, in therapy. And the therapist said, you know what? Sometimes it's just really hard being a person. And I was like, oh my God, say that again? What? Mm -hmm. That is the most simple line I've ever heard. And yet so resident and I had concluded the pitch with that line and they were like we really want you to like think about that line and what that and they they knew that I had the past few years I've had we've had in our family like a lot of grief around we've had I two of my very close friends died and it's just yeah and you it sinks into you and also but the only way I see life is through the comedic lens and so I was like I feel like especially after COVID and after all the weird things that have happened in our world and like I feel like the world is ready for the world but you know whatever we've earned it yeah TV for sure. mm-hmm. is, is capable of processing a show yeah. that is about real stuff but yep. through a comedic lens and you know the show Mom they mm-hmm. really tackled like alcoholism and addiction through a comedic lens it was it was yep. laugh out loud hard jokes but it was super hardcore about intense stuff yep. intense 
So I just basically went back to them and pitched a show about a group of friends that are like friends, you know, but we met them at whatever age they were, 25 or yep. whatever they were. Mm-hmm. Meet them at 45 where life has had its way with you, <laughs> you know, divorce and addiction and, you know, all the things. Yep. And so that's kind of what the show is, the broad strokes. All right. Yeah. That's awesome. So now they got to put it together and see what happens. So like I pitched all the characters in the world of it or whatever. They bought it. I did a story document, which is about, they gave me some notes on it as going back and then I'll do an outline and whatever. So, but mm-hmm. the, the characters and kind of the, the setup is all kind of there. And then, I mean, I am manifesting that we go make it cause I really feel, I feel close to it. Yeah. Like personally so much. It's like other ideas I've pitched are just more like, it's funny cause I think it's funny. Mm-hmm. And this is actually like, is important to me because yeah. it resonates on a personal level. So yeah, are you gonna pitch yourself as an actor in it then too? I don't think so. I think that like I think it would just be too hard to be honest, you know. And and I have a family, and I ha- you know it's gonna mm-hmm. be it would be hard enough running a show as a writer with four kids that are not you know that are little. My youngest is seven, so no. I think what I would do is. If all goes according to my manifesting plan, I would write myself a really funny character that comes and goes and, you know. Would would 27-year-old Marisa be like, you're crazy. You have a chance to be a lead on a network show <laughs> and you're going to turn it down. For, uh, uh, probably, but also I don't know that I do have that chance because I think they, I had a show when I had the other show go. I wrote, I mean, I can't help but write characters that I'm right for because yeah. it's just my voice, whatever. So I wrote the show and I was like, they were like, hmm. And I'd just been literally under a a holding deal as an actor with that studio and that network. Uh And it was six months later and I wrote the show for a character that I was 100% perfect for. And they're like, if only we could find someone to play this character. I'm like, I'm so confused. I think of one. But they they didn't want me to because they wanted me to be, they really, once they buy off on your voice, they like don't want you to be distracted with act. It's funny because they... I came up as an actor, so to me, I'm like, that's an important, that's the most, and they're like, that's, they don't think that's that important. They think the writer is. Yeah. Well, TV for sure. Yeah. That's what? TV for sure. That's TV, y- it's like a y- writer's medium for yeah, sure. Yeah, it's kind of yeah. sacred, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I get that. Any, uh, for those looking to get into the acting world or the filmmaking world, any tips or habits that you found that have led to any successes? Um. Well... I, I mean, along the lines of what I said about my birthday and setting that that deadline, I do find that as a writer, I can just think about an idea for like, if I don't keep track of it, like years will go by and I won't do it. And I'll be overwhelmed by like, what if it's not good and it's not? And I, I do think there is just no, I mean, I know this is like cliche, but there's just no, even if it all comes out and it all sucks, but it probably won't if you're like writing something you care about. Throw away the stuff that sucks later, but just write. Yeah. <laughs> and I will be, you know, the old like paralysis by analysis. I'll overthink my way into not writing for like a year. And then I'm like, oh, I just could have like COVID. I, everyone's like, what a great opportunity to get something. Mean, granted, we had, I had four kids at home. So like there wasn't that much opportunity. I couldn't go to the coffee shops, like whatever. But still, I do think there's just no, there's no. And, and honestly, most of the stuff that I'm the most proud of as a writer is stuff that I've just gone off and forced myself to write, not because I was being paid, not because someone else thought it was a good idea, not because whatever. It's because I really, it just came out of me and I didn't outline it and I just puke it out on the page and see what comes out. And, I, and I'll read it and be just as surprised as you would be if you read it. Cause I'm like, I don't, I don't even remember writing this. Right. So I do feel like if, stream of consciousness just forcing yourself to do it is like probably the most valuable thing how did, how did you find the discipline to keep showing up is that just a learned earned thing like ass and seat like force yourself I like, or i don't know if it's a Minis- midwestern thing i have a very strong work i feel really like down on myself if i don't like yeah. accomplish things yeah and so i guess it's just and sometimes i'm really annoyed by myself because yep. i have friends that don't have that and i'm like yeah. You're just like playing tennis all day. Like, I want to do that. That's so, but I don't, I feel like I, it's almost like this internal like checklist of like, I have to feel like I'm, I don't know. It's probably not healthy. There's probably some Freudian reason for it that's like messed up, but I do feel really, I I force myself. Otherwise, I'm kind of down on myself. Same. I think there's something with creatives where we have maybe 
enough internal self-loathing yeah. to start off with <laughs> yeah, maybe. that if we're not, you know, putting ourselves on the page yeah. or in a performance that, I think so. yeah. I yeah. think, yeah. I mean, the, and I usually like the one thing I got probably the most, um, I probably had the most success with as a script, TV script, I, they'd never made, but I sold three times, I think was extremely personal to me that I literally just wrote purging being a mom with young kids with like approaching 40 with ma- mid marriage, you know, all the things I just vomited it out and it because it was true it just was honest and then it was embarrassing because I put stuff in there that was kind of embarrassing and people would read it and be like oh my god this is really (laughs) embarrassing that you wrote that but I also totally relate so I feel like that stuff it is it's just cathartic and you just if otherwise it just eats you it doesn't do anything good in there (laughs) it needs to come out yeah yeah as an actor I don't know I don't know I guess my I guess my biggest piece of advice other than that is just if you are an actor, become a storyteller. Like don't wait around for somebody else. Mm -hmm. And if you don't think you're a storyteller, you are a storyteller because no matter what, the most personal thing you can tell about you that nobody else could tell, tell it. Because, you know, even if it feels like unimportant, if you get into the weeds of the specifics, it is important because ultimately we all have our humanity in common, right? But... It took me a long time to. I mean, when I first started writing, I was like, "It's about two crazy cops, and one's an old, mm-hmm. <laughs> old crabby guy, and the other guy's young and whatever." And they were like, "Yeah, we don't want to buy that from you. Like, mm-hmm. there's n- none of that sounds like anything that is from your personal experience." And I was like, "Oh yeah, that, that's what you want. It's my personal." And then I realized the more I would draw from like my exact personal experience, and the more specific I got, the more people were like, "Okay, that we want because." Yeah. Only you can tell that authenticity. story. Authenticity. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. And there's never been, you know, we, actors and creatives have never had this much power and tools at their disposal to, like, tell their stories or to, to disseminate their stories, Completely. right? Like, I mean, and I haven't... I, I would like to be the person who's like, I'm going to go shoot a full feature on my iPhone because I, you can. I yeah. bought one of those... Um, What's it called where you can like push in and um dolly? Is it like it a it wasn't a dolly but a uh, um gimbal? It's a gimbal. It's yeah. like a it's like a hundred dollar gimbal with you uh-huh. put you with your iPhone and it's like amazing how good it looks. Yep. But I haven't gone and like made a movie with it. But yeah. I feel like God, if you I you can do that and it's amazing. I mean when Andy Hunt was saying to a young actor that came up to him and he was saying, you know, you these project in four K, like go just make your movie or make your Three minute short or whatever. Yep. So yeah, there's no excuses anymore. Yeah, not really. <laughs> yeah, I know. to me they're like I should be doing it, but yeah, yeah. Uh, on the flip side, any lessons from losses or setbacks? I mean, I guess just like to get back up. I mean, if I there, if I like, like I said about the auditioning for commercials, like if I counted up all the rejections, it so so many people would be like dude pack your bags and go home like this this is not going well for you there are so many um low points but But the best actors have a horrible batting average oh my god like it's i mean crazy bad and embarrassing like auditions and it's like it's yours to lose and i'd go in there and just be so nervous because it was mine to lose and i would just be like (laughs) horrific i'm sure if i saw some of those tapes i would just be mortified and you know um so many embarrassing just just like go home like your tail between your legs just like that was just so bad (laughs) nobody laughed and whatever but I don't know somehow I would just like give it a give it a week or two and then get back out there same with act with writing I'll pitch and you know the last couple years it's become harder I mean it's, it's hard like it's it used to be like a lot easier I think to sell something in the network space and it is super not easy. And I feel very grateful. I have friends that I have relationships with because I don't, there, there's no way they would have bought the show for me if I didn't have those, you know, if I went in there and I'm like, it's about grief and loss and it's a comedy. Like, well, you wouldn't have got the meeting to start. I yeah. hundred percent. No. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I guess just, you just, you have to be real thick skinned, yeah. really determined and just yeah. get through the pain of all the low points. Yeah. It's like, What's the Ted Lasso line now? Like, have a memory like a goldfish? Yeah. Just gotta... Honestly, I think I do. Yeah. Because I think sometimes I'll remember like, oh, yeah, God, that was really bad. <laughs> but I just, yeah. oh, let's not think about that. Uh, what's one thing that you believe that maybe goes against the grain or maybe? Um, 
I don't, it's so weird because the industry is in such flux yeah. right now, too. Yeah. It's like what was true you know, three years ago might not be true now. I honestly don't know what's true anymore because I, I feel like every, I, I, like we're about to go. We were going to send the movie out to – we're just going to start, even though it's a long shot, by going to the streamers directly instead of going to – you know, obviously it's a Hail Mary, but like if, if Netflix is like, yeah, we want your movie, that's great. Yeah. Oh, they've dissolved the entire acquisitions department. They're no longer acquiring movies, like, at all. Mm -hmm. I'm like, oh, okay. Yep. Well, take that off our list. <laughs> you know, it's like you can't even keep up. I started, I signed up for all the deadline and the variety, and you almost, you almost don't want to know. You almost just want to, like, stick your head in the sand because you're like, I, it yeah. seems, it, as my manager said, it's like somebody said to him, this might be kind of what you had in mind, but somebody said to him, like, well, the, 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 the business is, is, fucking impossible right now I, or i'll do this without the f-bombs but the the industry is impossible right now like there's there's no way to get anywhere it's it's nothing like it used to be he's like i'm sorry could you remind me when was it back then that this industry was ever fucking easy right. you know? yep. I mean, it's, it's like it never was it never will be it might be a little bit harder now but it's probably just as it's just as always it's just a hard business yeah it's always been hard yeah. there's zero question you just... gotta be basically just crazy to you gotta want it that bad to be like demented all, it... all my friends are like running giant you know like their ceos they're, they run divisions they're of just normal companies you know yep. like whatever they, yeah but they all they all look at you and they're like oh man she's done it she's really I mean, they do i don't know do. i feel like i look at them and i'm like that just looks so stable <laughs> nice. grass is greener we've heard that one there, before yeah you know yeah well, it's, we, we need everybody, right? Yeah. We need those folks. We need people yeah. like you. Dude, there's actually this really cute book by uh, Leo Leone called Frederick, and it's it's basically about the role of the artist in the world. And it's the cutest book because it's about all these mice, and they're just like working and working and doing all their like busy, busy things to collect the food and collect the things for the hibernation. And one of them is just like staring at the stars and they're like what are you doing like you're supposed to be helping and he's like i'm collecting ideas i do I'm, know this yeah the story he's the artist mm -hmm. so when they're all hibernating and they got their food and they're in the dark he starts telling stories to them and it's like uh, what he was doing to prepare was dreaming and thinking i love it it's oh the my cutest God. story in the world yeah we need it I we mean, do yeah it's an important it's just as important as all the other jobs i don't yeah. I hope because <laughs> I don't know how to do any other jobs. Well, yeah, I mean, you can't like survive on stories alone, but what kind of existence is that? No, no one wants to live in a world without stories or entertainment. I know. Like any TV or film or movie that you've recently watched that has left an impression that you think we should know about? Uh, have you seen the movie About Time? I know of it. Um, I it's not a new movie. It's a no, new movie. It's, it's maybe ten years old. Yeah, no, it's um, the. It's Bill Nighy, 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 yep. whatever, and um, that red yeah, he, head, yeah. and then um, is, Rachel McAdams. Yeah, yep. High recommend. Mm. It's such a good movie. Mm -hmm. It's like a magical movie. I just watched it with one of my kids, and we were sobbing at the end. And granted, mm -hmm. it's relevant. It's like, it's a t little bit about the stuff we've been talking about, you know, but it's a really good movie. But recent movies, not really. I've been trying to watch Baby Reindeer. I'm not really totally getting it yet. Did mm -hmm. you watch it? I haven't, but yeah, it's the, there's the, so much talk about it that I'm not going to see what it. the hype is. But I don't really totally get it yet. But. Yeah, no, I it, it's kind of icky in kind a of way. Icky, yeah. right? I'm not yeah. in the mood for icky right now. I'm not now. either. Yeah. So like, I'm in the same boat. I, I'll watch anything that makes me um, happy and kind of mm -hmm. unwind from how upsetting the world is. <laughs> so like stalker movies is not really on that list <laughs> uh, -huh. uh not to go there but did you have any of those issues back in the day um i mean i've had weird like weird stuff yeah. you know people um uh, taking over my accounts and pretending to be this and sending me weird letters and yeah, yeah, yeah. some some but nothing like super crazy or super scary yeah no no baby reindeer yeah. no baby reindeer level no yeah uh so we talked about the abc thing we talked about Days When the Rains game. Uh, any other future projects that you're really excited about? Um, well, yeah, I mean... That's a lot. You don't have to have I any know, more. Yeah, no. I'm, I'm going to go back and do a pass on that script that I wrote that, on spec that mm. is, um, I, I hope, good. <laughs> like I said, it's one of those things that I cranked it out. I'm going to... I've reread it once, and then I just was like, I'm just going to let this marinate and like reread it again and make some edits and then show it to a few people and yeah. see what I think. But yeah. I hope. And it, it's, it's set... I said everything here. And I, you know, in my dream world, if, if it's, 
if I like it, it would be really wonderful to make something here. You know, I talked to Mandy Turpin a lot after the panel and I would, it would really, I, if I could find a way to make a TV series here and this one would be easy to, really easy to shoot here. Now I've learned the hard way how to like make movies, make things cheap. Like it takes place in a house and a yard and a one bar, you know, but I would, in my dream world, again, putting it out there, I would, if it's, if the script is good or the next one or whatever, I'd love to make a show here. Yeah. That'd be really. We'll, we'll chat later about okay. that. Okay. And then we'll have you back and we can talk about how yeah. it's going. Yeah. I would love it. Yeah. This is fun. I love doing this. Uh, if people want to find out about the movie or about your career, is there any place that they should go that they could follow um, Instagram along? Instagram is probably the place I'm the most What's on the, social. So under your name? Yes. Okay. I think it's Marisa Dot Coughlin, but okay. yeah. We can put a link in the me. notes. Yeah. 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 Okay. Well, right. thank you for being thank here. Thank you so much. It was so fun. It was awesome. Yeah, wonderful. Cool. Anything that I said that was weird that I should re- say differently or anything? All of it. We got to do it over. Yeah. <laughs> Take two. Let's he, go. He wasn't recording. That was, that, was, that was the rehearsal. Okay, good. We should film the rehearsal for Get now. Get comfortable. On. Yeah. <laughs>